Today's seminar focuses on the issue of nuclear testing, a really painful um, and really underexplored issue, especially from the standpoint of people who had suffered the testing, right? Um, so we're talking about voices that have not been heard enough, have not have been uh, generally marginalized. But the focus of this seminar, uh, and you can see the, the abstract on the announcement and on, the, uh, on our website as well, is really on the ways in which uh, these indigenous communities, because for the most part, for, for most of nuclear powers and for most of nuclear testing, it is the native and indigenous communities that suffered disproportionately from nuclear testing. How these communities found their agency, how they uh, kind of grabbed the narrative, how they reclaimed uh, their history and, and their interpretation uh, and found their voice um, and how, the, how it translated itself into political and social and cultural forms uh, that help these communities process and cope uh, and also achieve some modicum of, of justice um, uh, that was certainly due for, for, their, uh, for the wrongs and for their suffering. Uh, Without further ado, let me introduce with great pleasure the moderator for this session, Tegjan Kasenova, who is not only um, a fantastic scholar uh, in her own right uh, on, on the issues of nuclear testing um, as well, but also is a dear friend. Uh, and it is my pleasure uh, to welcome her here. Um, uh, Dr. Kasenova uh, is a Washington based senior fellow at the Center for Policy Research at SUNY Albany, and is also a non-resident fellow um, in the nuclear policy program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, her research focuses on nuclear politics, uh, WMD nonproliferation, and financial crime prevention. Uh, she currently works on issues related to proliferation financing controls, uh, exploring ways to minimize access of, prolif uh, access of proliferators to the global financial system. Um, and uh, from 2011 to 2015, uh, Tugjan served on the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on Disarmament Matters. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, she is an author of a new book, a really important book, the Atomic Step, How Kazakhstan Gave Up the Bomb. Uh, that is, um, uh, I encourage you all to read it. It's a, it's a very necessary reading this day and age that not only um, kind of explains Kazakhstan's story through Kazakhstan's eyes, through the eyes of Kazakh people, uh, but also gives a glimpse of a broader uh, social and political context of the Soviet dissolution in which it happened. So without further ado, uh, Tegjan, uh, the panel is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Mariana and colleagues. It's just such a pleasure to be with all of you here today. And when I saw the, the speakers who agreed to speak at this panel, I, I thought, oh, this is a, really a, a dream panel. It's my pleasure to serve as a moderator, and I'm just really excited uh, about this. I also I think it's I, I applaud um, managing the Atom program, Mariana and your colleagues and the previous fellows um, for coming up with the idea of atomic voices, but also specifically about this panel. I think it's so important that the stories of communities that suffered from nuclear tests around the world that at least sometimes they're told in parallel, because I think when you when you look at these very different places and you see how similar the stories are it's it makes the message even more powerful in terms of some really disturbing similarities and that's of course the fact that you know among those who suffered from the u.s nuclear tests um, there are uh, native american tribes uh, people in the pacific islands and from the british nuclear tests uh, the native tribes in southern australia from the french nuclear tests in uh, indigenous tribes in algeria and also people of french polynesia and the chinese the least talked about program at lopnor nuclear testing site that's actually you know the main um 
the 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 main <laughs> groups there are um, Muslim minorities, Uyghurs, and there is just I, I really think there is not enough that is uh, said or um, about that program. And of course, my own native country of Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is a multi-ethnic society, and all of people of Kazakhstan were um, negatively impacted by the Soviet nuclear test. But it just so happens that majority of those who really uh, suffered the most were ethnic Kazakhs, partly for cultural reasons, because they, they were so on the land and so dependent on the land and uh, raising livestock and, and, and so on. And, um, as somebody who focused on the Kazakh story, but also read about other programs, it was really, I think, so disturbing to me how similar the language and the attitude was. Um, just very similar patterns of talking about communities as some um, inferior people or people with no agency or talking about the land as uninhabited or barren, even the, the semantics of, 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 I think, of the narratives was so important and so telling. And, um, and of course, you know, there was definitely the, the power dynamic angle in all of that, that those who were conducting nuclear tests um, we're basically deciding fates of somebody else. And, and Mariana, I appreciate that you point out that, um, you know, sooner or later, those communities were able and they, you know, throughout their, 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 their history, they, you know, they constantly were trying to, to fight and there was always this struggle, but I'm just glad that I think especially now we see more and more of this reclaiming the agency and really there is no way those stories can be hidden. Um, and what I appreciate so much as a scholar is that, the, you know, the last few years there has been so much of fantastic scholarship coming out and, and the our speakers are the, the representatives of uh, those amazing uh, new, new um, academic scholarly policy pieces uh, that are being presented. Um, I also, you know, wanted to, to, to give a plug for the new book of Robert Jacobs, Global Hibakush. I think it's also another important book. It's 3 a.m. in Tokyo, so he, he, uh, he, he's not listening to us now, but I, I just encourage the audience to um, to check out his book as well. And, um, and just a couple of words about my own recent experience of going to Kazakhstan and launching my book um, in Kazakhstan, in Kazakh, I think I underestimated myself, even though I am Kazakh, I'm from Kazakhstan, of how important it is to, to tell these stories and to generate those discussions and to, first and foremost, to show the communities that suffered from nuclear tests that their stories are not forgotten, that they are important, that people care, and that um, there, there should be this search for, for nuclear justice. So with that, I, I just wanted to let the audience know how we'll proceed. We'll give each speaker about 10 minutes for prepared remarks after each presentation. Uh, we'll take maybe a, a few questions. We'll see how we go in terms of time. And then we'll also use the, the time at the end after all the presentations to have a more general discussion. Um, I encourage you to use the Q&A uh, box to pose questions to our speakers. Uh, we'll, the order in which we'll proceed, we'll first um, hear from uh, Magdalena Stavkovsky, well, followed by Sebastian Philippe, and then Jess Jessica Schwartz. Um, so it's just such a pleasure of mine to introduce Magdalena. Uh, you have her full bio in the event description, but I, I just wanted to briefly say that she's an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology and the Faculty Associate at the Walker Institute for International Studies. Uh, she's also a researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies, studies in Co Copenhagen 
and a fellow in the Center for Slavic, Eurasian, and East European Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. But I want to add just a personal note. Um, Magdalena will, will share it more in her remarks, but she's this incredible scholar who spent a significant period of time actually living in Kazakhstan, living very close to the former Soviet nuclear test inside. Uh, she's been through some incredible experiences. Uh, I And she's the... She's very generous with her scholarship. I remember many years ago uh, when she completed her PhD dissertation, she kindly shared, I think it wasn't even the final draft or something, um, but I just, I'm, not only as a nuclear scholar, but as a Kazakh, I want to thank you for your dedication to the subject, for, for spending your time on trying to understand what happened there and for, um, yeah, really been devoted to, to this topic. Uh, so with that, Magdalena, I invite you to, to start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Takjan, for an amazing introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for inviting me here. Um, this is a really great opportunity for us to have a very important conversation. I'm going to share my screen uh, because I pr prepared a PowerPoint. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay, perfect. So <clears throat> I'm gonna take about 10 minutes or so uh, to give an overview of my research and some of my findings. So speaking to the themes of this seminar, I will focus this brief presentation on new forms of social and cultural empowerment of communities who are left to deal with nuclear testing legacies on their own. How they cope with things is what I study. As an anthropologist, I have been conducting research in, um, in and around the semi palatins nuclear test site, locally known as the Polygon, part of the decade. I'm interested in the wide spectrum of social processes and with that, the local effects of an emerging class of sufferers who have been impacted by vibrant discourses about them. The place I talk about today I call Koyan, a village that borders the polygon. So let me give you a little bit of background. Lands in and around the semi palatines test site are historically Kazakh, and since the mid 20th century have been linked to a variety of Soviet projects. The polygon is 7,000 square miles, roughly the size of Israel. On that plane, the Soviet Cold War warriors tested more than 450 bombs between 1949 and 1989, unleashing the power of more than 2,500 Hiroshima-sized explosions. This included above and below ground testing, cratering explosions, the so-called moving, earth-moving explosions. So if you look at the map here, right in the center is ground zero, where all the above ground tests took place. In this area here, known as the Degelen, testing occurred inside mountains in horizontal tunnels. Here, all testing was done underground. And right here, what you're looking at is a lake called Atom Kol, or the atomic lake, the largest atomic lakes in the world that was created after an underground blast, uh, which was used to test um, and see the feasibility, feasibility of diverting rivers. This territory and its atomic history has been one of Kazakhstan's greatest challenges out of the Soviet period. And Tokjan, actually, we, we spoke about this, but she writes an uh, amazing book about this process. And right here, by the way, this is ground zero photograph. Um, and this is a photograph of one of those underground uh, nuclear explosions that created a crater with the lake on the bottom. So going back to this map, there are known, both known and unknown levels of radioactivity coming, coming from common fallout sources like cesium, strontium, and plutonium. And if you look at the map, what you read here are some of the traces of radioactive fallout left by two above ground explosions. Residual radioactivity is hard to map 
And it is hard to study because it migrates with variety of environmental processes, rain, fires, and wind moves uh, these elements around. Overlapping this great disaster scape of the 20th century were scores of collective farms or safhose where people lived, worked, and raised families in an area geographically similar to the Great Plains of the United States. For four years, workers of these state farms became the Cold War scientific establishments convenient to use local parlor experimental rabbits. Thousands throughout the region were secretly monitored for all and any signs of radiation exposure in a secret clinic whose front was zoonotic diseases. There were to monitor people and to collect a variety of data on people, animals, and the environment. Until the fall of the Soviet Union, no official information or real medical assistance was offered to those examined by this military medical project. Even though many people can recall bombs and seeing mushroom clouds, it was only with Gorbachev's openness in the 80s did anyone learn about atomic testing. Having heard from Victor ill of livestock abnormalities, media testing, as well as learning about the accident in Ukraine, the polygon became a symbolic rallying point around which the Nevada Semipalatinsk anti-nuclear movement, led by Kazakh poet, intellectual, and activist Wolja Sulemianov, took. This coalition pressured the new Kazakh state, headed by its first president, Nazarbayev, to end nuclear testing and close the site, which he did in 1991. Today, an estimated 50,000 people live next to and sometimes inside of the officially recognized borders of the polygon. In many large and small villages, people live predominantly off the land and do not observe the polygon border, which is exceptionally easy to miss. Inside several areas where fissile materials like plutonium and highly enriched uranium could be scavenged are indeed protected. The vertical shafts of the Balapan field are enclosed with concrete, and there is a designated 37-mile exclusion zone at the Degelen mountain complex, which is also fenced off and guarded by drones. Otherwise, few signs point to radiation danger. Today, in fact, there are several mines on the Polygon territory extracting salt, fluorite, manganese, coal, copper, and gold. For thousands, the test site is a local geography, and there are hundreds of roads through it. During summer months, people drive all across this dusty steppe region to visit relatives in other villages or to conduct commerce. In the summer, people collect wild strawberries. Koyan itself is only a few kilometers craters caused by underground nuclear blasts. In some places known to be hotspots, High concentrations of radioactive cesium, strontium, and americium were vented into the environment across several kilometers. As stock breeders, many sheep, goats, horses, and cows throughout the area, even near craters that serve as convenient watering holes. And the government has shared information with Koyaners regarding places to avoid. What I found. Koyan is an ice of around 50 people who go on with their lives among the ruins that surround them. There is no longer running water, no grocery store, gas station, medical clinic, or even a school. Koyaners, like many others, have learned to live with the polygon and embrace the past and have devised exceptionally independent and original way of life for their daily existence how they make a living, how they relate to the world outside, and how they choose to stay on, why they choose to stay on contaminated lands. In fact, Koyan residents have taken all that has been thrust on them and make it a virtue, creating themselves from medical and social practices that stigmatize them and economic practices that leave no room for them. And let me just give you three brief examples as they relate to the ways in which people deal with radiation, economy, and marginalization. So radiation. One of the things that struck me about people in Koyan is the lack of fear of radiation and the rarity that they ever spoke of it. 
self-described as being adopted to it. They see themselves as biologically different, even from their own ancestors. Individual perspectives, of course, vary, but most people have come to believe that their bodies have adapted to a radioactive ecosystem, consequently thrive in it, and actually are harmed outside of it. When we traveled through the polygon to visit relatives for birthday parties or during the Muslim holiday Eid, people often said, Others who left, they said, have died. means we are used to radiation. Indeed, Koyaners and others like them living near the polygon embrace radiation as a sign of their own genetic fortitude, a reflection of their political, economic, and social space that allows them to retain a certain level of freedom, a tactic to feel normal. They interpret chronic ailments such as high blood pressure and cancers, among other illnesses, which they link to past and present radioisotope exposure as the physical manifestation of their adaptation, what I have come to call their mutant subjectivity, a unique survival strategy that's informed mainly by scientific studies about low dose radiation exposure that portray the polygon populations as genetically corrupted, which they don't see themselves as such. Economy. The collective farm that the grandparents were forced to join during the Soviet era, that came to pay people what they remember was a decent wage, has been dismantled after the fall of the Soviet Union. Koyaners instead made a virtue of their post-Soviet joblessness by embracing the free market opening of the polygon. Mining is already happening and there are plans to open most of the site for farming. And this is despite clear risks in that proposition. Moreover, Koyaners have maintained their collective farm as a cooperative enterprise, a kind of neo-socialist corporation where everyday life is not dictated by maximizing profits, but by concern for the collective survival of the village for mutual assistance. This is a response to a lack of good economic options after Kazakhstan's introduction of free market reforms that turned once vibrant rural and urban areas into emergent realms of austerity. Marginalization. There are countless examples of social discrimination and stigma that people from rural areas and especially the polygon experience at regional hospitals, schools, public institutions, and elsewhere. How they are perceived and treated, especially in urban centers, carries over from culturally introduced notions of modernity stemming from Soviet-era colonial rhetoric about the, quote, archaic, and quote, primitive rural Kazakhs, and also as biologically the rural urban divide hardened into a rigid social distinction that continues to impact popular thinking about geography, culture, and status. Koyaners and others like them are often perceived to be bumpkins, too backward to be allowed to participate in civilized activities. Yet the villagers are unfazed. Instead, marginalization has left them indeed confined to the village where these veritable outcasts are able to live without experiencing the multitude of stresses from encounters that the outside world provides. Unlike their ancestors who ranged for hundreds of miles a year, they have made a virtue out of their enforced settlement in one village. Thank you. Mangdeth, thank you so, so much. Um, we already have a very good question from Mary Olson, who uh, is also working in this field and uh, doing fantastic work. And uh, if I could ask you to address her question, um, she acknowledges that it's very important to talk about impacted communities and individuals that they're acknowledged and supported. She's interested to hear about any ways that gender social role for female and me and for females and males in Kazakhstan creates opportunity or barrier to this acknowledgement. That is an excellent question that I've been actually um, most recently writing about. One of the things that happened after the fall of the Soviet Union, and that has happened not just in Kazakhstan, but more generally in the post-Soviet space, has been the retraditionalization of gender roles. 
And in places like Koyan, uh, when there was a collapse of the Sofos, of the collective farm, um, people reinvented their, their, you know, they tried to continue collective farming. But what has also happened is that the gender roles uh, were rethought with, within that process. What this means is that women who were once tractor drivers, uh, people who, women who participated in, you know, gathering hay as citizens in the Sophos life, all of a sudden found themselves relegated to the domestic sphere. So in places like Koyan, women, for example, today, uh, do all the cooking and cleaning and deal with all the household chores um, that are actually necessary to sustain this collective endeavor. What this means, of course, is that it doesn't allow for many women who I have worked with to make many decisions about what it is that they can do. So more often than not, uh, in some ways, I, <laughs> one could imagine uh, the will be the case, women are stuck um, living in isolated villages. They oftentimes don't have the education, they don't have the skills to find a job. Um, oftentimes they don't speak Russian, not that it is necessary to speak Russian, but it is helpful to speak both Kazakh and Russian in Kazakhstan. Um, and oftentimes they don't have access to the necessary resources, which of course also includes uh, medical care in places like Koyan. So I hope this, this answers your question. Oh, thank you, that, that's excellent. I want to encourage our uh, listeners, I can see we have quite a good number of participants. Um, if you have any questions as we go, uh, you're welcome to put them in the Q&A. Um, but also you'll have another chance towards the end of the webinar to ask any follow-up questions. Um, I wanted to ask you something that I've been struggling with, and I just wanted to hear about your experience. As somebody who is not an expert on radiation or, you know, we're not medical doctors, in your research, and I know you come from anthropology and maybe it's a bit different, but for me, it was really hard to depend on others, on other experts, and how do you create this narrative, especially when the narratives are so conflicted? And I just wanted to ask you, how, how did you approach it as a scholar? I ended up having to rely on a lot of experts for that. Uh, I am, you know, prior to my work, I actually, um, you know, some of the people who were on my committee during my dissertation and some of the experts that I that I still rely on are epidemiologists and nuclear experts, um, people who work uh, illnesses um, that uh, some people believe are related to exposure to residual radioactivity and so on and so forth. But you're right, it is very hard and dense material to wade through given that there are lots of conflicting sources, lots of conflicting materials, there are debates. I mean, even a simpler thing is, you know, how do we define low dose radiation? Even if we define it, some people may say, well, it's more dangerous uh, than other forms of radiation, or it's actually good for you. So there are lots of debates. So for me, it was really a lot of reading and trying to grapple and understand what is happening. Um, Kazakhstan itself offered an interesting counterpoint. Here is a country where the Soviets have conducted 50, 40 years of medical research and have written up all sorts of things about chronic radiation syndrome, something that in, in Western science, it's, some, it's not something that's talked about. Um, so it offered a different perspective on our own debates that I incorporate um, in, in my own work. But, but in the end, you're right. It's, it's really trying to figure out what the strands are and follow the story. And that's what I've been trying to do in my own work. Thank you, Magdalena. There are so many other questions or comments and just, you know, I have to forcefully stop myself from, from um, 
getting into um, uh, a greater discussion on, on Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan's experience with the Soviet nuclear test. For now, I want to thank you for your presentation and we'll come back to a group discussion. I want to move to our next speaker, Sebastian Philippe, and he's a scientist. And that's another thing that I love about this panel is that everybody comes from uh, different backgrounds and and. Um, so he's a scientist, associate research scholar on public and international affairs with Princeton University's program on science and global security, and his research focuses on nuclear arms control, disarmament, and justice issues. I was so pleased to see justice as a, as a separate uh, entry. Um, most importantly, and the most recent wonderful contribution that Sebastian made to the field um, and to seeking justice is the book he co-authored, which is called Taxic. And I think for now it's available only in French, but the, the website has a lot of material and it's available in English as well. And the book was the finalist for the French uh, equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and won a 2022 Sigma Award for Best Data Journalism in the World, uh, among other many recognitions that uh, were received. And, um, and I just want to give the floor to you now, and we are so delighted and eager to hear um, about your experience of researching, writing, and promoting the work that is connected with the French nuclear testing program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stockson, and uh, thank you uh, to the Managing the Atom team for inviting me back to the program where uh, I had the chance to do my my postdoc uh, in 2018-2019. So very happy to be here and very happy to be part of such an amazing panel and thank you for Magdalena uh, for your excellent talk. I, I, I learned a lot. Um, I am just going to share my screen. I've prepared some slides as well. Um, and I hope that you're seeing them right now. Okay. Um, so I, I, I um, the, the topic of my talk today is, is going to be about my, my research work on the legacy of nuclear testing. Um, French nuclear testing in the Pacific and in spe specifically in French uh, Polynesia. Uh, but today I didn't want to kind of title the talk in that way. I, I, I the, the title I, I, I came with was um, supporting transformative justice for independent scholarship because I think ultimately this is what this work was about. It was to um, uh, bring a, a, an inter interdisciplinary group of scholars, um, social science, humanities, um, and uh, nuclear science, myself, um, together with investigative journalism to dive into an issue that has been in contention for, you know, over 60 years almost, uh, which is what was the um, radiological health and environmental legacy of French nuclear testing in the region. Uh, unlike uh, Algeria, where French started testing, uh, that is now an independent state, uh, French Polynesia is a territory of France. It has a particular status, auto autonomy uh, of autonomy with a local uh, assembly and government. Um, so it is kind of different from uh, some of the other places where testing happened. And so before I, I start jumping into this, I just want to uh, remind everyone the 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 obvious, uh, which was Mariana was was mentioning earlier today, um, was that uh, I don't know if we can remove this control panel. Oops. Oops. Yeah, is it better here? I don't actually see. Do you still see my slides? Okay. Um, so since uh, 1945, over 2,000 uh, nuclear tests took place worldwide, 528 were atmospheric, and all of them uh, took place um, in, in location uh, where communities had no choice or say whatsoever about that enterprise. And that enterprise 
uh, was fundamental in developing uh, still, you know, existing care and nuclear arsenals, and um, and uh, participated into research and development efforts at making those weapons bigger and bigger and more and more lethal uh, in some sense. The radiological impacts on Donwin communities all over the world. Uh, despite those, uh, you know, decades since atmospheric tests had ended, uh, in many countries it's still not fully understood. And we have some information for some of those test sites, but someone mentioned, for example, the Chinese test site, and it's extremely difficult to find data on, on what happened there. So I want to acknowledge this. Um, but something that I think is a, a key point that I want to make today is um, that we are, as NAWE here, I'm, I'm, I, I want to uh, you know, just scholarly community and and and, and experts in the near in nuclear field. Uh, together, we are, I believe, equipped to know revisit this legacy uh, and 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 to do so in a transdisciplinary way. Uh, and in particular, today I want to chat how about how historical and technical analysis based on public data, the analysis of primary source, historical government documents, and modern scientific tools can allow us to independently reconstruct and evaluate the radiological impact of those fallouts on the Dunwing communities um, and to essentially support them in their struggle toward justice um, in the way they understand and they seek justice themselves. Um, so as I say, my focus will be about uh, French nuclear testing in the Pacific. Um, France started testing nuclear weapons in Algeria first before Algeria became independent. Um, and then um, after the independence of Algeria, part of that deal was that France only had five years left to continue testing and then had to move its test site. And they decided for various reasons to move the test site um, in the Pacific, in French Polynesia, where they were planning to develop the French uh, uh, hydrogen bomb and needed a place to uh, explode uh, megaton scale nuclear weapons, uh, just like the American and the British had done uh, nearby in Kiribati and the Marshall Islands. Uh, France tested 46 atmospheric nuclear weapon, uh, atmospheric uh, conductors, sorry, 46 atmospheric nuclear tests from 666 to 74. And this was at a time where the partial test ban treaty had already entered into force. And so the US, uh, Russia, and the UK were not testing any atmosphere anymore uh, because we knew already at the time that there were consequences for the online communities. And nevertheless, the decision was uh, taken to continue uh, such testing. Uh, the fallouts from those tests impacted all uh, the islands, a French Polynesia, over 100 of them. Uh, this was considered a place that was completely empty. Of course, it was not empty, and this was this was um, the home of over a hundred thousand uh, inhabitants at the time. Uh, and um, those places, um, as I say, were were all uh, exposed. Um, the testing ended. <coughs> French nuclear testing ended in 1996, and it is really. I would say after the end of the, there, there was a long struggle for justice and um, and efforts into reining in the French nuclear testing enterprise, trying to push the government to go underground uh, for its testing and so on. But let's say that the modern civil society, uh, the most recent society, civil society efforts, um, towards accountability and justice really started after the test site ended because that kind of opened up the possibility to have discussions that were absolutely impossible to have before. Uh, and so I want to highlight here three groups um, that all together represent uh, and also help uh, people who were directly impacted by fallouts uh, apply for compensation or you know help them uh, sue the French government to obtain fin financial compensation. Um, and most of the people here we're talking about uh, suffered from cancers. Um, 193 uh, especially is focused on helping members of the public. Um, Morai Tattoo has been the 
uh, group that has been supporting former workers and in particular Polynesian workers that were at the site. And then we also have a group um, we represent uh, former military and veterans who were exposed at the site. And so sometimes they have been working together, sometimes um, not. And uh, but uh, it is really uh, this collective efforts that uh, 14 years after uh, the end of French nuclear testing uh, led to uh, recognizing by law a status of victims of nuclear stress and open up a way for financial compensation for people there. Of course, in the background of all of this is uh, political struggle and um, fighting in, in, not political fighting, but uh, let's say uh, efforts and different political faction in Polynesia about either seeking independence or an autonomous status under France. And so all of this together need to be taken into account, but I won't be able to talk too much about it right now. But this law in uh, 2010 started really opened up a whole new chapter. Unfortunately, the way the law was set up, it was pretty much impossible from anyone to obtain compensation. Uh, in the first seven years of the law, 97% uh, of the claim were rejected. Um, and so, um, when I started working on this project in 2019, uh, the law had just changed and uh, there were an improvement, but compensation for members of the public was still extremely, extremely low, especially for the Polynesian public. It was in the double digit numbers, people who had been, uh, you know, obtained compensation. And in Algeria, there was a single person who had obtained compensation uh, from the government. Uh, so through the struggle of those civil society groups, um, and as part of uh, you know this effort of being first recognized and asking uh, the government to recognize what had happened and acknowledge the arm, uh, they also, as I say, are helping people uh, uh, obtain some some justice here. And as part of this process, they asked the government to start declassifying documents of what were the measurements that were taken at the time of the test, uh, the contamination of the environment and the food chain, uh, and how people had been exposed um, to uh, radiation uh, you know, externally and internally by, by, by uh, consuming contaminated food. Um, and all those documents essentially were the basis of government studies um, that were published without any references to primary sources. So anything that people had as the basis for making uh, decisions of justice or in courts was based on documents that were published by uh, the institutions of the government who were responsible for making the tests and never had shared the underlying uh, primary sources from where they were basing all this, all, all this analysis. So uh, in 2019, actually, when I was at Harvard and as a postdoc, uh, I got an email uh, by uh, someone who would uh, become a, uh, a friend, Abel Ahmed, um, um, who told me, uh, look, I, I got all those documents declassified for a civil society lawsuit. Uh, I can't really, you know, first they're in French and then they're very technical. Can you help me? And this was the beginning uh, of this project. So uh, this archive contained 200 declassifying documents, really outstanding and unique in the sense that it really kind of provided an overall view of what had happened uh, and, um, and data because that data was protected by, um, uh, it was secret and classified, essentially was uh, perhaps more, uh, genuine that uh, that what you uh, where we could read until that point. So our goal here in this project very quickly became to uh, provide an independent assessment of the radiological uh, consequences by independently studying the health and environmental uh, impact on, on the communities using those uh, documents, uh, but also uh, using basing uh, our analysis and doing the peer review of all the existing government studies that are used uh, today for compensation purposes. And uh, we found, of course, uh, shortcomings along the way. Um, the methodology was really to combine scientific research with journalism, uh, leveraging upper source analysis, interviews, legal analysis, scholarly research, 
the simulation of radioactive fallouts and the verification of uh, retrospective dosimetric computations. It took two years and there were up to 12 people who were involved in the project. So just to show you about you know, what, what can we do today in terms of simulation, this is a simulation of the fallout from the first French nuclear test in Polynesia that took place in 1966. And by um, using the historical weather archives that we have today and modern particle transport software, we're able to reconstruct you know, what government would show, which was those plume maps, and try to see you know, and assess um, the validity of those data, essentially. Uh, and um, so this first test was pretty important uh, um, in the story of, of French nuclear testing in Polynesia because uh, it directly impacted one of the communities who was living the closest to the test site. Uh, where people were living on the Gambier uh, archipelago. Uh, and the government realized right away that something wrong had happened. Uh, they, they sent uh, a survey team on a ship that went to the island uh, and took measurements everywhere in water and food, on people's clothes and their uh, you know, outside and so on. Um, and went to the conclusion that yes, an accident had happened. Um, but, and this is a medical doctor who was part of the expedition, the head of the expedition, concluded that uh, it, it may be necessary to minimize the actual numbers to avoid losing the confidence of the population uh, because this was the first test and we, and we had many more to do. Uh, and so uh, we, we wanted to make sure that, you know, we could continue them. Uh, here, the problem was, of course, that uh, uh, the recommendation was followed on, but, but even more in the sense that people were never told what had happened. And they would have to wait past the end of nuclear testing, really, to have a sense of what had happened then. Um, and so 55 years later, after this accident, and this is um, uh, made public for a project also, my, my colleague, Thomas Tassius, who was a journalist on the project, uh, found the first, for the first time, an official document who uh, explicitly mentioned a direct link between the radioactive fallout from this test and others on that particular communities with an excess of uh, thyroid cancer. Uh, this was for the first time that uh, this information uh, was really made available uh, to the public. Um, on top of this first you know, uh, test and its impact, we uh, or I simulated essentially another uh, seven of them or five in the, let's say in the first uh, in the first uh, phase of this project. And one particular uh, test in 1974 was the last one that one of the last one that took place in Polynesia. and this one impacted the most, uh, inhabited island of Polynesia, which is Tahiti, uh, and essentially uh, exposed uh, more than 90% of the French Polynesian population at the time uh, to uh, to a follow direct fallout and then their contamination, uh, their uh, consumption of contaminated food. Um, taking all of this information and all the data we found in the declassified documents, we peer reviewed the government studies and we found shortcomings. Uh, not only in the government studies themselves, but also the way um, the administrative entities who was, who was educating on claims was making its decisions. Um, and we found in particular that pretty much the entire population, it was impossible essentially to rule out that pretty much anyone in Polynesia uh, did not reach the threshold exposure for compensation. Uh, so 90 percent of the population could have received radiation dose above uh, the current limit for the public, especially following the center test, and that the pool of eligible claimants should be increased by a factor of 10. Uh, we found that the maximum doses that are computed by the government were in uh, several cases underestimated by factors of 2 to 10. Uh, and so it's really by correcting all of those factors together that um, essentially the entire population um, could be eligible for compensation should individual develop certain kind of cancers that are uh, recognized under French law. 
So all of this project uh, was published in various formats, a book, Toxic, which uh, contains the full uh, work and investigation, uh, was co-authored uh, by Thomas Tedges and myself. Uh, the Mura Files, which was the online uh, visualization key takeaways platform with where we also publish all the declassified documents that we used uh, for the project. And finally, the scientific results and the methodology on the reconstruction of the fallout, but also the peer reviewing of the government studies was, was published in a peer reviewed uh, journal article. And all of this is now uh, available to the public in a fully transparent way, which is also a first, I guess, uh, uh, at least from the French perspective. Uh, so this work had a pretty uh, important policy impact, and I'm just going to have two slides and then I stop. Uh, but that impact was really the results of what civil society did with those informations. Uh, so, you know, we, we did our study, we published it, and then essentially at that point, our job ends. Uh, it's not for me to carry things, you know, forwards or to move the agenda politically. I don't take those decisions. Um, this is the end of you know the work of the researcher essentially. Um, but so it is uh, that that uh, civil society who uh, really uh, pushed very hard to ask for more transparency from the government, for improved compensation, and for the president of France to apologize. Um, <clears throat> And so the political response was, uh, you know, beyond beyond any ex my expectations, I would say, to say the least. Uh, there were parliamentary actions, including the introduction of new uh, potential legislations. Uh, MPs who floated the idea of parliamentary inquiry. We were, um, I had to testify. I mean, I, I participated in hearings at the National Defense Commission of the Parliament. Uh, the, pre the, the Polynesian government started a truth and justice working group. And finally, the president of France himself went in July of last year for three days, uh, giving a keynote speech where he didn't apologize, but he recognized that France owed a debt to, the Pol to Polynesia. And uh, to, I believe, the, for the first time, rebutted the myth of clean tests, that the test had not impacted the population. Uh, so there was kind of a big, uh, a big speech uh, from the president, um, which followed by an action plan and items that he mentioned in his talk, which was to increase access to compensation uh, for uh, the local population. Uh, unfortunately, this is really focused on a subset of claimants. Well, it's a good thing uh, because we're, those were the most exposed communities, uh, but there are still a limitation to this effort, and in particular. Um, there are issues with recognizing the full extent of uh, the exposure and uh, attending this to the entire population of, popula of Polynesia. And I think this will be eventually adjudicated through litigations in courts. Um, the open archives, I worked with 200 documents. There's, there's over 100,000 that are now available. Uh, I probably won't have time to read all of them in my lifetime, but I hope other researcher will, will help them with this process. And uh, they also worked on environmental remediation, which was a key demand from impacted communities. So um, I will stop here. And Thank you I look so forward much. to questions. Thank you. This is uh, so inspiring. Um, you know, the, especially towards the end, the, the impact that you can show and that it was so tangible because often in our field um, there is no immediate gratification uh, but it's incredible what you you and your colleagues were able to achieve we have a very good um, question that came in uh, in the chat from austin cooper and the question goes on uh, like this how can claimants mobilize these new findings will the administrative entity CVAN, I guess, award compensation on this basis? Will claimants have to go to court? Will courts award compensation on this basis? Or will all state entities treat the state conclusions less favorable to claimants as fact? That is the million dollar question, I would say. Um, 
Thank you, Austin, for your question. Uh, and it's a very important question. And I, as I said, this is where, where uh, things are moving now. Um, there is there is no attempt at pushing back uh, on on trying to, um, you know, uphold whatever the government had been doing until then. Um, but as I said, uh, the current the current way the French law works with compensation of victims is that it is the government who has to prove that they were not exposed mm. above a certain limit. Mm. Um, and so I believe that, you know, our case is very strong. Uh, I mean, and I believe my data and all of this is published and it's independent and it's peer reviewed and all of this accessible. Everyone can do the calculation by themselves, essentially. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I think uh, ultimately it will be decided in court. And uh, I don't know where in the French court system, you know, it's kind of like the US system, you have different you go uh, up the ladder, uh, potentially up the Supreme Court. So we'll see. And uh, my hunch is this will be uh, really educated in the coming year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a few cases that were already kind of, um, I believe, building on, on, on our work, uh, but they were all granted compensation based on the constitutional decision that took place last December. Essentially, it was for a a, a category of claimants who had apply um, at a certain time uh, uh, when the law is kind of changing in between. Uh, so we didn't have an answer on this, but um, I believe this is where you know where 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 things will go is how to um, judges take into account uh, scientific data and analysis uh, that is peer reviewed and done according to international academic standards. Um, so it's for them to eventually decide. There is no class action lawsuit in France. So that's a huge, huge um, hurdle for uh, the communities and that were impacted because they have to kind of file individual claim. Uh, and so it takes a lot of time, energy and money to do so. Uh, and so they they need uh, you know they need uh, help, uh, legal help uh, and technical help, expert help to kind of get their case through. So um, it's not it's 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 a process that will continue for for some years. Yeah. Thank you. And there is uh, uh, another good question from I uh, I think Anaï Morer. Thank you for this great talk. And uh, she's wondering if you had the chance. To look at the book that was published just two days ago by the French CA, purporting to refute the conclusions of Toxic, given that you worked from the French military's own archives, how are they managing to contest your findings? Um, I have not read it. Read it. I don't have a copy. Um, I'm hoping to get a copy next week, uh, but it's it hasn't been made public. Uh, as a PDF, so it's hard for me. It was only presented in entirety. Mm -hmm. uh, what I've seen online, I can say, I've only seen a graph online. <laughs> um, and uh, it's like uh, wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. So my hunch is like they haven't read um, or taken into account the scientific publication that details everything um, because it's not cited as far as I can say. Uh, in the document, so I, I don't know, um, and so I hope that you know whatever we do, we'll be able to, to uh, respond. But uh, as I say, ultimately, I think at this point, um, it is for the courts to kind of uh, take their decision. Mm -hmm. um, and but there is one thing I must say, which is astonishing, is uh, what I've seen briefly in the news about this is. Um, after the president came, most of the French institutions really worked toward implementing his plan, um, except one of them, uh, who kind of really, you know, took to offense mm -hmm. with what had happened, um, and that was the military, uh, the, the, the division for military application of the Atomic Energy Commission, which was on, on, uh, in charge of testing at the time, mm -hmm. and so, you know, it's... Uh, 
were just dealing with uh, trying to understand their point of view. Uh, and of course, in institutional practices are, are difficult to uh, evolve rapidly, as rapidly as we would like them to evolve. So uh, it will take time, I think. And if I may, you know, the last question for at least this, this component, um, and maybe it's a little bit personal, but uh, as I was reading your bio and that, you know, the fact that you served as a nuclear weapon system safety engineer, um, and, you know, within the Ministry of Defense, and, and now you are a scholar uh, working on the impact of those nuclear weapons, right, and just uh, going towards really using your scientific skills and background um, in the struggle for justice. I, 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 yeah, I just wanted to ask you whether at any point you had those, um, the institutional tension within you, or how, how, like, how did this path occur for you and yeah, was it natural no. yeah i mean that's a that's an amazing you know an important question um and i think it is you know a, a decision that one stick for it for itself but uh i had no never planned to work on that topic uh especially when i was at harvard i was working on something completely different um but it was going through that material and reading it Mm -hmm. um, um, that I realized to the extent that what had happened. So, um, you know, there were documents that were showing that communities and children, for example, mm -hmm. had, had, had been left drinking contaminated water with fish and products for weeks after uh, radioactive rain had fell on the community. Um, and the list of children was in table with their date of birth and the rainwater system from which were, they were drinking. And there was a whole debate in this classified documents about what was the impact on them and, you know, the dose and all this. And, um, you know, that's an ethical decision that as a researcher or as a person you need to take. And, um, and for me, uh, not doing anything was, was worse, of course, than doing something. Um, so uh, I, I have no regret, and I look forward to continuing working on this uh, and carrying this work forward as much as I can, and uh, uh, through all the obstacles that will, uh, you know, uh, be uh, or coming our way. But so far, um, so far, I think uh, it has been an extremely positive uh, experience and, and a positive impact, I believe, for. Um, for the local community that were thank that you were the ones who were impacted the most yes thank it's you the least we can do <laughs> yeah i i applaud you uh thank you for sharing in such a sincere way i just want to admit that for me i, I was also starting my own research from a completely different angle i was only interested in politics and diplomacy and decision making and foreign policy but I can relate very much to what you are, what you are saying that once you see something with your own eyes or start realizing the extent, um, yeah, I, I think the, yeah, it, it it's not even a, a dilemma. It's it's um, it's something I think that we should take on as as scholars and and we should put our um, training to to good good use thank you so much for your presentation and for answering the questions our next speaker is uh, jessica schwartz uh, jessica approaches research on musical representations and sonic histories of militarization and imperial violence through community focused collaborations movements and creative descent uh, she is the author of radiation sounds Marshallese uh, music and nuclear silences. Uh, Jessica, it's just such a pleasure to see you. I've met you a few years ago, and uh, I all your 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 work uh, I left such a big impression on me. And um, it and and again, just <laughs> both as a scholar, but also on an individual level, I want to express my gratitude for uh, working on such an important angle of of how nuclear weapons programs how they impact cultures culture and traditions and way way of life and 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 so we are very 
pleased that you're part of this panel and, and please, we look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm so appreciative to be on this panel as well. And I really appreciate the Managing the Atom Atomic Voices seminar. Um, I'm a part of these have been some, some great presentations, super important issues. And um, I'm just gonna begin. So uh, I actually, going to, well, I'll just try to read as much as I can. Uh, my picture is covering this up a little bit. But anyways, I titled this Radiation Songs in the Marshallese Pursuit of Nuclear as Social Justice because the US nuclear weapons testing program and nuclear militarism disrupted the entire Marshallese social structure as we'll see. So, I just wanted to share briefly um, a, an image of where the Republic of the Marshall Islands is. It's an archipelago um, often talked about as two chains of atolls that are rings of islets, but there's actually a third chain customarily that includes Bikini, Rangalap, Rangarik, and Ilinganai. The uh, You'll notice in the north, and these are the um, atolls, in, including Enowetak, which is slightly um, towards the west, that were um, in the center of the U.S. nuclear weapons testing, um, with Enowetak and Bikini being uh, ground zeros. And um, the Ranglapis, as I will share, um, becoming conscript conscripted into um, secret uh, classified U.S. governmental radiological studies. So I'm going to be talking about radiation songs. And these are songs that make the often silent consequences of U.S. nuclear weapons testing, the secretive U.S. government radiological studies and the insensible presence of radiation in the lands and bodies of Marshallese audible and sensible. This is a... Um, what I have here, the image, uh, it says radiation is something we can't see, hear, taste, smell, feel, or sense. And this is from the uh, US Department of Energy, uh, formerly the Atomic Energy Commission, um, when it was uh, going around in the uh, early 1980s, prior to the Compact of Free Association to educate Marshallese about the presence of radiation and Marshallese have their own experiences with the impacts of radiation become audible and sensible in songs, even as information is being restricted by the US government. So these songs also draw on indigenous customary chant stories and chant story and song um, that you can, you can see this better than I can. I'm gonna, there we go. Let me let me just move move myself, if you don't mind. There we go. All right. All right. So these songs draw an indigenous customary chant, story, and song that often amplify the, the connections between Marshley's human and non-human bodies, as well as the missionary and colonial lineage of musical materials, transforming the symbolic associations in the nuclear context from hymns to keyboard music to rock. The role to rap. Marshallese radiation songs are predominantly voice-based or vocal, both in the literal sense and in the political and metaphorical sense of giving voice to injustices. In the literal sense, Marshallese voices refer us back to the throat, which as I will explain has a special meaning when it comes to Marshallese bodily metaphors and perceptions. So just a brief uh, missionary and colonial history. So in the 16th century of Spanish um, sailors, uh, explorers didn't really colonize very much of the Marshall Islands, but were a presence. Um, then in, uh, that's out of order, in 1857, the uh, American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, the ABCFM, uh, settles on Ebon. It's, it's a longer story, but for the sake of time, we'll leave it at that. But importantly, uh, they bring uh, hymn books 
and um, they bring this idea of conventional musical harmony, certain moral notions of harmony, and they take the Marshallese children to school, separating children from families, and they disparage chants and traditional instruments and dances. It's a kind of vocal disciplinarity. We're going to see connections with this disciplinarity and nuclear disciplinary, disciplinarity in terms of, of a certain enervation of indigenous vocality and culture. So um, the Germans come um, in 1885 and then in 1914, the Japanese administration. Um, I have an, an image of uh, German traders with a Marshallese woman um, using a keyboard there. <clears throat> Continuing our nuclear colonial history that I have begun to discuss. In 1945, the United States takes over after World War II. Uh, they set up in Majuro, and in that's the capital, and in Kwajalein, where there's the military base and the Pacific Proving Grounds, and in Bikini and, and away talk. Um, through, from 1946 through 1958, the U.S. detonates 67 nuclear weapons, including in 1954, the 15 megaton thermonuclear bomb, Castle Bravo, which vaporized a Bikini Atoll islet and sent radioactive fallout across the archipelago and the world, but most concentrated in nearby atolls, such as the Rangalap Atoll, where the indigenous community was present for the fallout. And they weren't relocated until 48 hours later either, where they were taken to Kwajalein Atoll, the military base again, and where the US government put them in Project 4.1, classified medical and experimental study of human radiation subjects without their consent or concern for culture. We see the fallout pattern from Bravo um, here, uh, the lower part of the screen and the um, an image from Project 4.1. So continuing our, our history here, 1979, there was the independence of the Marshall Islands from the United States and the first national anthem is composed. Uh, it's composed in a way that reflects back to the land, the land and the matrilineage, which are very important. 1986, when the Compact of Free Association is signed between the then um, Republic of, or the now Republic of the Marshall Islands, which becomes Republic of the Marshall Islands in the United States, there's section 177, the Espousa Clause, which is a one-time settlement and a one-time settlement for the past, present, and future consequences of US nuclear testing. Uh, so this becomes the agreement with the United States and the RMI, and it bypasses the individual atolls. So the, the individual atolls can't um, litigate uh, the United States. They can't um, take them to court, and they have to go through this mediator, the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And the second national anthem is composed. Um, there's an image of the second national anthem. It's, it's, it's more um, anthemic sounding in a kind of international scope. Um, and uh, it doesn't refer back to the land and the homeland in the same way that the first national anthem does. There's a, there's a moving away here uh, from the indigenous um, cultural aspects. So radiation songs begin to be composed with directed political attention to US and Marshall Islands governments here. Specifically, the Bikinian anthem becomes codified as such, as the Bikinian national anthem. It was an, a song of loss before from 1946, and Mariba, or Menotem on each becomes the motto. And I'll play a clip from where that is um, in a second. The song Radiation becomes composed by a song group and is covered for radio play, and displaced Rangalapis compose songs about radioactivity in lands and bodies um, as greeting songs for other Marshallese who come to Majato and Kwajalein to help them where they're staying. And they'll take the songs back to Maj Majuro for help as well. So let's start with the Bikinians. So in 1946, the United States staged a nuclear transaction between the leader or chief or King Judah of the Bikinians and US Commodore Wyatt. They used half of the world's uh, video equipment um, for the the testing and the staging, and they mediated this as, as part of the goodwill of, of the uh, U.S. Americans in the post-war. Everything's good, and they're willing to go, and everything is caught, and 
Well, you tell them and King Judah that everything being in God's hands, it cannot be other than good. So, we hear at the beginning, Menatham Judge Reji Lubenanich. Everything is in God's hands. Moriba. Moriba, around the time of the compact, becomes written into the Bikinian culture. We see the Bikinian flag with the words, with the motto. And we see a Bikinian, atoll school, um, Bikinian school uniform on this child with the motto as well. Um, and underneath the motto is, is a, a, a book with the RMI flag and a bomb is coming out of that, almost coming toward, towards heaven. So there's a lot going on in this shirt. There's a lot going on in this flag too, for the sake of time. I wanna move on to the song Radiation that gets composed around this time too. Let's just hear a little bit of it. The first verse, which is in bold. And uh, pay attention to the words, please, that I have um, put in pink. Oh, you would Valentina said that she was so confused when asking, will there be a cure? What things will make my, my throat and Marshallese body perceptions, the heart, the center of the soul, the connection between the humans, non-humans, land, community, what will make that peaceful because she is devastated um, or has a disrupted throat, and I'll get to that slide too, um, that is disconnected from the home sweet home. And she said, it seems like the only cure for radiation is more radiation. So Bromach, means grief, sadness, depression, but the literal translation is dead or deactivated throat, where bro is throat and mudge is dead, numb, deactivated. So what happens is with the exposure to large amounts of radiation, the, there are many, many thyroid issues. So the thyroid examinations become part of project 4.1, but it was considered culturally inappropriate to touch the throat uh, and given Marshallese sensibilities um, that I spoke about. And we have this picture of male doctors who are performing thyroid examinations. Um, there are a lot of breaking of, of gendered and cultural taboos um, that uh, again, I, I can't get into uh, right now, but when we're thinking again about, about songs amplifying and making audible, what becomes insensible, um, the voice becomes noticeably altered with thyroid removal and surgeries. And women, for women, it's more noticeable than men because of their lowered voice. And there's an out of a certain gendered vocal bound specifically. And we think about the uh, missionaries bringing over the soprano alto tenor bass. The soprano is prized as really vocalizing you know, women's capacities in song. So cultural perception and gender issues are um, crucially uh, impacted, and there's a stigmatization. Um, we have some quotes here. After the uh, Almira Madayoshi says, after the bomb, we can't harmonize anymore. Everyone's voice is a bass, and there are no more sopranos amongst us. We have no interest in singing anymore. People make fun of us when we do and say, a thyroid mene, or that thing of a, that thing near you is thyroid, or that thing of a person has a thyroid problem. Ellen Boas says, at the time they cut my throat, I thought they, well, I don't really know. I can't really sing anymore, but I want to sing again. But now I can't, my voice won't go high anymore. Is that not from contamination? So the example from the Urang Lapis I'm gonna play is from 2010. It's These are my questions for you now, still, because the Urang Lapis have been asking questions about their health since the test since the examination started. They don't feel that they're getting the answers. This song in particular was composed by Lejean, who's pictured. 
Um, she composed it because of the ongoing health questions and concerns that she and the women in her community had continued to have over the years later when the US Department of Energy refused their participation at an official event with the Marshallese government, all of whom were men at the time. Lejean performed the song in a singer-songwriter fashion. Um, she was part of a rock and roll band living in the United States, so she performed it in a number of different idioms. The song protests the US Department of Energy silence and on radiogenic illnesses to the indigenous community. It asked questions in a subversive way in a song by formalizing silence and nuclear injury and shows the material consequences of US atomic power, which bolstered the United States, how singing voices break down due to thyroid issue and removal. And here's a brief clip of the song performed by the Ranglapi's women in Madro for nuclear survivors and victims remembrance day in 2009. <laughs> So in this song, which is asking about questions about the classification of their own bodies and information from their own bodies, the Rangalapi's women are declassifying through their culture, through attention to the throat, including when everyone becomes quiet and the audience starts clapping and the conductor turns around and says, no, it's the thyroid, right? The, the thyroid is, is forcing the silence upon us. The radiation is forcing the silence and there's a struggle to be heard. And so it shows again, the material consequences of atomic power, how singing voices break down due to thyroid issues and removal, and it amplifies damage to the throat, the Marshallese center of the soul, barometer of social health and consubstantiality, declassifies damages to indigenous worldview, social structure, intergenerational means, of relating and connectivity between human and non-humans. And I'm just gonna end with uh, specifically, actually, because um, every, you know there has been conversation about what do you do? And I was asked when I was in the Marshall Islands from 2008 to 2010, what could I do? And a lot of my interlocutors um, were interested in, because I'm in you know education, I was a graduate student at the time in educational, uh, an educational initiative or scholarships. Um, and so when I went back to the United States and I was interested in visiting the diaspora community and the families of um, people with whom I, I worked, uh, after a lot of consideration, um, members of the Marshallese community and non-Marshallese educators, including myself, um, established the Marshallese Educational Initiative, which is a nonprofit in Springdale, Arkansas, where the largest continental diaspora of the Marshallese are. And just to conclude, we uh, brought Nuclear Remembrance Day um, to Arkansas. Um, in we uh, had it held in the uh, Clinton Presidential Center um, under the Clinton presidency. Project Four Point One was in part declassified. We wanted to put a larger um, larger pressure to further declassify. And so uh, quickly, just a few seconds of, of a song from, from Rangalapis, uh, who were in Arkansas at the time, um, singing about Section 177. <laughs> And uh, I'll just say that there's a, there's a lot more in, in my book that uh, just came out um, recently, Radiation Sounds, Marshallese Music and Nuclear Silences, if you're interested. So thank you very much. Jessica, thank you. It's, um, it's very powerful. Um, uh, yeah, I'm almost speechless. Thank you so much for conveying the stories. Um, you, you, you showed us so well how the violence of nuclear tests is not only physical or, or doesn't stop at physical, that it goes much further. It's the disruption uh, that goes beyond and uh, cultural and traditional ways of life. 
I wanted to ask you if you, in your research you came across, or maybe in your conversations from the U.S. side, maybe from the side of some, I, I don't know, U.S. military who served there, or did you pick up on any remorse or fear of uh, fear of what people think about all this or guilt? Um, I, I'm asking because. Nobody from the Soviet or Russian side directly expressed it to me, but I know indirectly that uh, there are those emotions and fears and, and guilt, uh, which is not expressed formally. But did, did you pick up on any of that from the U.S. side? Well, I think, I think that's a great question. I think that there, specifically, you mentioned U.S. military and their atomic vets. And there are a lot of emotions around um, some of the atomic vets um, who have at times participated in the Nuclear Remembrance Day ceremonies. And what it seems is that there is an increasing interest in dialoguing with the Marshallese community to understand better, um, which I think I'm not it could be related to guilt, it could be related, it, I think there's, there are feelings possibly of, of empathy even, um, and concern, and care even, and uh, part of that becomes, let's educate ourselves to really the depths of what happened, to what we are a part of systemically as individuals, and, um, you know, because a lot of U.S. Americans you know, many of, of whom uh, were not in necessarily in the military, there is a guilt, there's a sadness. I think that um, from the few that I've met uh, in the, who were in the military, or who were out in the Marshall Islands, um, there's, there's almost like, oh, we didn't know this either. What happened? What really, so there, there are a lot of emotions with that too. Um, because in a way, atomic vets, they, you know, they're kind of victims in a way themselves. Um, yeah, I, because very often those who were making decisions are not the ones who are actually in those areas and uh, being, you know, directly exposed. Um, I, I just had another question, and I know it goes beyond... Uh, mm, like the music and the singing and 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 culture, it's it's a more political question. Um, you know, for the Marshallese, do, do you there, there appears to be this tension when um, the the Marshall Islands still depend on the U.S. for provision of its security and defense, and at the same time, it, you know, there is this search for justice and. And again, I'm asking because I'm I'm seeing some parallels between you know. Kazakhstan and Russia, for example. Um, I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts of how do you think Marshallese are managing this tension of uh, that exists, I think. Yeah, and I think, again, different atoll communities, and I'm going to answer this politically, right, in terms of representation um, and also in terms of the political songs that I heard. Um, in terms of, this is why I brought up uh, the COFA, the Compact of Free Association, which has those provisions for the U.S. military to remain on Kwajalein. It has the stipulations for, as you said, the security, the protections. The So the, in the, the nuclear affected atolls, though, you know, we can argue that all of the atolls are nuclear affected to disproportionate um, and to differential degrees, the ones that were perhaps most disproportionately impacted did not vote for the Compact of Free, Free Association because they didn't want the RMI again to be the mediator and to decide on how the U.S. was going to dole out this compensation uh, or what would be the terms of reparation, what could be the terms of healing then. Um, so it's it, it it's very tense, but then you have the what has been called the colonial stranglehold of the Compact of Free Association. So I would just answer that, and and I think that's where in some of the the protests are, you know, there needs to be protections that 
perhaps there are other ways of of finding and securing justice that aren't so again aren't so much part of the colonial struggle mm -hmm. thank you jessica and now uh, my question is to all of you speakers um what does new how does nuclear justice look to you in very practical tangible ways or what's nuclear justice for you I can I can start. Um, it's a it's a Please great mind. question, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. John, um, and 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 it certainly requires a complicated answer. If you look at a place like Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan didn't just inherit a nuclear legacy; it inherited millions of tons of not only radioactive waste but heavy metals, PCBs, <laughs> and other chemicals. I mean. It was a place upon which the Soviet Union experimented in all sorts of ways. I mean, we can even look at today at uh, the Baikonur Cosmodrome, where proton rockets and different stages, you know, fall over, literally fall on top of people's heads. Um, and the accidents with heptofuel spills that are occurring periodically every once in a while. So we're in a country that is dealing with pollution, which is a problem simply too big to clean up, realistically. Because, you know, when I spoke with scientists in Kazakhstan, one of the things they said, it's like, you know, it would be so much easier to show you a map of places that are clean in Kazakhstan than give you a map of all the places that are dirty. Uh, so even cities like Karaganda, that is deal with its own coal pollution and mercury and the river Nura, I mean, thousands, millions of tons of waste that, 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 Kazakhstan has yet to deal with. And it requires money and it requires time. Um, and radioactive pollution is quite hard. I'm, I'm not sure how one goes about cleaning up plutonium <laughs> or americium, for example. Um, for the people of Koyan, in many ways, I mean, Kazakhstan does have a compensation program. It's too little, but Kazakhstan, again, how does one afford supporting 1 million, 1.2 million people who are officially recognized as victim, very difficult to do that. In the most practical sense in Koyan, uh, the, be the best solution would be to, uh, you know, isolate um, and, and uh, you know, either pour concrete or put fences around areas that are radioactive, uh, make sure that there is monitoring of water and land around where people live, and that people are informed about where they should and should not be going. Um, it's a very practical solution and it's an easy solution. Uh, do Koyaners and people in and around the Polygon want to move? No, because there are no places for them to go. Um, and there are no real solutions. How do you move a village of, you know, livestock breeders to, you know, a, a medium city? It makes, it makes no sense whatsoever. So justice in this case, that's actually tangible, something that could be done, requires a little bit of work. Uh, requires education, requires securing and securitizing some of the areas that are most polluted. Um, and that's a way to deal with it. And the other part long term is we do have to ask a question, you know, what responsibility does Russia hold? Mm -hmm. Russia, as, as, as many of you know, you know, they're not the Soviet Union, so they don't see themselves as responsible for Soviet era. Well, on matters that where they don't want to see them. Yeah. Yes, them. yes, 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 of course. So that doesn't matter. Um, and they yeah. have, you know, the other benefit. ones who inherited the benefits of the Soviet yes. nuclear program. Yes, right? they want to make sure that that's, <laughs> that's there. So, so, but those are questions that need to be answered because I think justice has to come from, from that as well. I mean, you know, Russia as an inheritor, um, or, you know, the legacy of, 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 of the Soviet world, um, there should be some sort of a conversation about what it is that we do with people who have suffered tremendously as a result. Thank you, Magda. Um, Sebastian, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's both uh, an excellent question and, and uh, perhaps, you know, the, the hardest one to answer for me. Um, because I mean, for one thing, it's unclear, it's for me to give that answer, you know, what is, the, you know, what is justice in this case? 
um, I don't really, I can't, I mean, I, I don't feel like I have ownership or, you know, to answer it in some sense uh, of, of what happened. Um, what I can say, and, and also because, uh, you know, in the context of Polynesia, um, it is continued to be uh, part of France. So, the, you know, the colonial reality essentially is still present. And it's very, so, you know, what is justice in this context can uh, take many form and uh, and also many form of political action. So it's, it's uh, so I, I'm just gonna say that, um, um, yeah, that's, it is very, it's very hard to say what I can, what would be justice? Uh, I can only say what I think is injustice. <laughs> I think to go, to go to connect with what Magdalena, uh, Magdalena uh, said is, um, uh, we're still in a situation where people are not told the full story of what happened. You know, even in France, it was a Western democracy. Um, we're in a situation where even in 2022, uh, some part of the government are going to, you know, print and do communications uh, without providing any scientific, any scholarly response to what happened. Uh, don't tell necessarily where and how things had happened. Don't declassify everything. Um, there are areas that are polluted. People want them back. Uh, it's hard to get them back. Uh, cleanup cannot can never be done. I guess you know there's always this question about what can you know the justice for me is always kind of where we are today and where we are and where are we going. Um, and so there are things that are they will never be able to unmake. Mm -hmm. And so there are things for which there will be essentially mm -hmm. never justice the way perhaps I understand it. Um, and so it's a very, yeah, it's a tricky question so, and a poor answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, thank you for your honesty, but also thank you for your humility that, thank you. Jessica? I mean, I, I agree with with everything that's been said kind of relative to you know, the position that I'm in the, uh, you know, work that I've, I've done, I think I'll pick up on the um, impossible yet importantness of the question and the idea that, you know, a lot of, a lot of Marshallese can't go back, social structures, um, the imposition of the, of the nuclear military, um, the fear of, of radioactive land and, and bodies and, um, you can't undo that. That's that's now generational. Mm -hmm. And um, so just, you know, clean up, though it it's important, you know, it, it can't undo that. And I think that's why I, I brought up the, you know, the end, the, the nonprofit, because what I was hearing were uh, requests for education and not only education, um, about nuclear issues, um, educational spaces where um, intergenerational um, learning could happen in the United States, uh, where there's a, a push to assimilate to, you know, Western education, where the um, non-Marshallese communities don't understand why Marshallese are in the United States, mm -hmm. can be hostile, xenophobic, racist, um, you know, don't understand the culture at all. And that's really trying, you know, so it's just layered and layered and layered and layered and the injustices and oppressions are layered and layered and layered. And so I think part of the question of justice, nuclear justice is, is understanding these systemic, systematic, and then structural like weights that are being kind of placed and trying to pause, note them, for example, say COVID, disproportionate impact to Pacific Islander Native Hawaiian communities, right? For the Marshallese in particular, immunological issues from the you know, nuclear weapons testing become you know, foundations where you have uh, comorbidities that 
COVID is then taking elders that then the intergenerational communications can't happen, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think some of the work we're doing um, in the nonprofit uh, and some of the work, the, the research and, and articles that I've been trying to, to write around that are again, trying to say, look, nuclear justice also demands that we think about these other injustices. And, and I guess that's kind of where I'll, I'll leave that. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. I'll just add from myself, for when I think about nuclear justice, my very minimum, this is very basic, but I think there are two components that uh, should be non-negotiable, and that's formal apology. And second, it's legitimizing the pain and the sacrifice and the continued legacy of nuclear tests. And uh, in my travel in Kazakhstan, I often felt that the most important thing is for them to be acknowledged, for their pain to be acknowledged. And, um, and um, yeah, for me, that would be just like the very first step, the, the very uh, basic component. Um, I just wanted to mention something that is a little bit forward looking, and uh, I don't know if you have um, maybe were following, um, but under the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, there are those Articles 6 and 7, and Kazakhstan and Kiribati are actually very actively involved in, in some intercessional work, and um, I'm just really glad that there is this really, I think at at several levels, at in um, in 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 different kind of forums, um, there is really this push of shining as much light on the uh, rehabilitation issue, on the issue of the survivors of nuclear use and and nuclear testing. And I just want to applaud everybody in every line of work: activists, civil society, journalists, scholars. And uh, let me just conclude our fantastic conversation by thanking each of you for the work that you are doing, for putting your academic training uh, to such a noble cause and uh, for, um, yeah, I, I think you really, uh, your work is so meaningful. And uh, I, I think I speak on, on behalf of the audience, but also on behalf of communities that, um, um, your work is really, really valuable. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. I thank our audience and uh, I just want to wish everybody a good weekend. Mariana, would you like to? Wonderful. I will just um, uh, say just a couple of words. I, I've learned so much in the course of the last uh, hour and 45 minutes. And uh, let me just second, um, you know, to John's uh, remarks, uh, um, an extension of gratitude for all the great work you do. And to John, of course, you are included um, you, for, for really, I think, you know, we talked about justice and, uh, and what it means. And what I heard a lot through today is bearing witness, right? Is, is really bearing witness um, and listening to those voices, sometimes literally, <laughs> as Jessica does, uh, right? And, and thank you so much for bringing, like these were truly atomic voices today that we got to hear through your work. Um, and, you know, the amazing photos that uh, Magda, you, uh, you took and, and the, the witness you bore to the lives of people um, near the test site in Semipalatinsk um, and Sebastian, you, uh, your fantastic scientific work that is, you know, bound to be incredibly impactful. We haven't seen all of the, all of the repercussions and all of the, I don't want to say fallout because that would be a bad pun, but um, all of the re reverberations that that will bring to the people of French Polynesia and probably elsewhere. So uh, let's give all a round of applause to all of our excellent panelists. Thank you so much for finding the time and I wish you all the best of luck in all of your important work that you do. And with that, um, all of you have a enjoy your Friday night, uh, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And thank you so much for the audience for staying with us through this. Thank you.